sincerely this morning on behalf of the pastor's family circle. We truly, on their behalf, thank you for coming today here in presence, emails, text messages, cards, all your sympathy and condolences. Sincerely, it is gratefully received this morning. And I was thinking of the bishop, as we know him affectionately. If he was here this morning, we'd probably say, Pastor Irwin, get them to lift an offering while they're here this morning. Could we sing one of these old favorite hymns? He calls it the golden oldies. My Jesus, I love thee. I know this is a service of thanksgiving. You know that by now in Whitewell. So let's lift the roof. Let's worship the king because his servant has gone to be with Christ, which this morning is far better. So let's worship the Christ that the bishop loved.
please remain standing. I'm going to call upon Pastor Ken Davison to bring us this morning to the throne of grace. Pastor Ken. Let us pray. Eternal Father, again, we thank you this morning that we come directly into thy presence in the most worthy name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you give him for us. We thank you, Father, for his finished work on Calvary's tree. We thank you, Father, for the precious blood which flowed from Emmanuel's veins. And we thank you, Lord, when sinners are plunged beneath that flood, they lose all their guilty stains. We love you this morning because you first loved us. And this morning, Father, we're gathered in unity with one heart to thank you for Pastor James McConnell, a man who has served you and loved you from a boy. We thank you, Father, for your hand on his life. We thank you for the ministry that you gave him and enabled him with. And we thank you this morning, Lord, there are many, many, many of us who are here and elsewhere, Lord, who have been touched by his ministry. We thank you for the souls that have been saved over these decades. We thank you for the backsliders that have been restored to faith. We thank you for the changed lives sitting under his ministry. We thank you, Lord, for the courage. We thank you for the determination. We thank you for the drive that you gave this man. Lord, we thank you that he loved us. He loved you first. Father, we just want to thank you this morning for giving us Pastor James McConnell, Dr. James McConnell, an evangelist, even a prophet unto the nation. And we thank you, Father, that you gave him and Father, we also thank you that we know him. We know him, Lord, as our friend. We know him as our mentor. But we think of the family this very morning. He's a husband. He's a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, a father-in-law. Lord, he's many things to many people. But this morning, this family is grieving. And we pray, Father, for your hand to be with them, for your love to be surrounding them. We pray, O oh God, this morning that they would know that underneath and round about are your everlasting arms, that thy blessed Holy Spirit would minister into their hearts and their minds and lives. Not only today may they find much grace and more grace, but, Father, in the days and the weeks and the months that lie ahead. So we think of Mrs. McConnell. We think of Linda and Norman. We think of Julie and Bran. We think of Rebecca and Nathan and we Charlie and all who loved the servant as we call him. Father, thank you. Thank you for James McConnell. Bless those that will come with a word of testimony of how they have been changed in their lives with a tribute to the work of a man who has been anointed of the Spirit. Lord, bless them and bless the word of God as Pastor David would stand forward and bring thy word. Lord, we love you. And we think of the pastor who taught us to love the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. We worship you. Now, Father, take this service on in thyself to glorify your beloved Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for leading us in prayer to the throne of grace this morning. At this point in our service, I'm going to ask Pastor Michael Bunting if he would come up right now and share with us a tribute to Pastor McConnell. Pastor Michael. I'll come here this morning with heavy hearts <clears throat> because we're mourning 
one of God's generals, God's servant, Pastor McConnell. He mourned his home going. To say we miss him deeply, it just doesn't cover it. But we know there's a land that is brighter than day, fairer than day. And by faith, we can see it afar. The Bible says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful, that he has left us rejoicing. That he's fought his fight. He has run his race. He's kept the faith. He has breasted the tape. He has entered into the joy, the infinite, the finite joy, the fullness of joy, the joy of his Lord. He's gone to a place which is called far better. And we know also that our sorrow and our pain and our grief are always temporary. For a short while, our tears are momentarily. The Bible says that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And I have the honor today to be asked to bring this little tribute concerning the bishop. There are three tributes in order of service. There could have easily been 300, and 300 after that, and 300 after that. But for my part, I've known Pastor McConnell and I for over almost 40 years. He wasn't only my pastor. He wasn't only my mentor. He was my friend. And friends are hard to come by these days. If you've got a friend, hold tightly to them. From the first day I met him until last Friday in the Royal Victoria Hospital, he never lost his love for Christ, nor the things of God. He loved the Savior. And you know something? He's taught me to love the Savior. He taught me to pray and the importance of a devotional life. He encouraged me to build up a library. He says, make your ministry rich, read books. And he gave me a taste for fish suppers. <laughs> Eddie Spence's, no doubt. He never lost his passion, his drive, his commitment, his zeal, his dedication, his laser focus. His Christ-centeredness has never diminished nor cooled down through time or even through circumstances. He was Bible-driven. He, he was Bible-driven. He loved preaching God's words. He loved preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. He loved the gospel of God. And he would preach it at a drop of a hat. He would say, it's like the sword of Goliath. There's none like it. He loved the cross. He loved the blood. He loved saying, are you saved? Are you saved? He loved saying, do you love him? He would say to me, Michael, the gospel covers everything. And he loved this house. He loved this people. He birthed it. He built it. And God blessed it. This was his baby. And he loved it until his last breath on Saturday morning. Cut him, and he'll bleed white well. He loved this part of God's vineyard. You see, he believed only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ would last. How many times has he said that? He held court in this, in this house for many, many years. On Monday night, he was the great prayer warrior, leading his people into prayer, praying for the needs of people, praying for the nation. Wednesday night, he was the teacher at the Bible school, in God's school, where the Word of God is expounded and taught. On Sunday morning, he was the shepherd, going about his sheep, encouraging them, binding up their wounds, lifting them up, putting Christ into them. And on Sunday night, he was the great evangelist, preaching the gospel and reaching the lost, throwing out the net, as he would call him. Is there another hand here? Is there another one who wants to come to the Savior? He will always tell his pastors, preach for a verdict. Preach for a verdict. And many a time uh, that he had preached, I felt I had been in the dock and I had been as found guilty as charged. And as a church, as a church, brothers and sisters, and you know the old hands I'm talking to, we were either in a mission, coming out of a mission, or going into it. 
we were either in a building programme, coming out of a building programme, or going out to it. He had a relentless visitation ministry, second to none. And he's taught his pastors that too, and the pastors who went out from this house to visit the flock. I used to say two-thirds of the world is covered by water, and the rest is covered by us. He used to be in the, to be in the hospitals before the doctors thought about doing their rounds. He was on the ball. His finger was on the pulse because he loved his flock. We all remember the Odysseys, the King's Halls, the Ulster Halls, the football and rugby stadiums, the leisure centres, the tent mission. Year after year after year. He's always said it was a move of God and many of us didn't realise it. But it was a move of God. Who could argue with that? And I've travelled with him to the USA, California, Nebraska, Louisiana, Estonia, Ethiopia, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. And by the way, the children in the Ethiopian school now, 500 children are watching them live online, watching this service. God bless you. He loved Ethiopia and he loved Kenya. I think one of his greatest parts of his ministry was that he birthed 60 pastors into the ministry. Ken is one of them. Jeff is one of them. Different ones came into this house and got a hunger and a thirst for the work of God. And the call of God was on them from Newton Arge to Nebraska. Oh, did our branches, did our branches not go over the wall? See, the old bishop, he was a pastor. He was an evangelist. He was a teacher. He was a builder. He was a church planter. He was a Barnabas. He was a leader. He was an influencer. He was a visionary. He was a defender of the faith. He was a shepherd, a husband, a dad, a granddad. And he was a friend. And yes, he would say to me this morning, if he was standing here, don't forget to tell him I'm a KKK. I'm the corny, corny, corny chorus commencer. Do you remember he started on the road? You sometimes he would start on the wrong note. Now, but listen, even the wrong note was good. <laughs> Pastor McConnell was always good fun to be with. Bishop loved to laugh. He loved a bit of crack, you know. He loved the banter. I remember him, me and him and Norman coming home from California. You went from California to one airport, and then you went from an airport to London, then from London to Belfast. And I can see him, you know, we, you've been in Belfast in a nice near airport, walking, and, before you, and he had his wee case behind him. He traveled light, so he did. He preached spiritually, traveling lightly, but he traveled light himself. And his wee case, he had the bare necessities, so he had. And he was walking down, and I looked, and he was tired. And I said, servant, the Bible says, the Bible says Enoch walked with God, but he didn't walk this far. The bishop said he did not. <laughs> I remember all the boys with him in the pastor's room. We got talking about spiritual things. We got talking about the resurrection and how God is going to raise us from the grave and all. The bishop said, imagine God doing that. What, what, what depth is a grave now? And somebody says it's six feet. Somebody says it's nine feet. And here's the bishop. Oh, imagine God lifting us out of them big holes. And I said, servant, he's lifted, it out, he's lift, lift, lifted us out of bigger holes than that. <laughs> and you can see the smile on his face. When coming home from Nebraska, the plane was three hours late. And we get taxied out of the runway and the pilot says, we're looking for clearance for air traffic control. Uh, we'll be up in the air soon enough. And the bishop looked out the window, so we did. And he says, Michael, tell him there's nothing coming. Away you go. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop had no words or grace about himself. He never forgot his roots. He never forgot the bowl that he was breaked in. Breaked in. Spring Street, East Belfast. And yet, he gets down with the greatest and with the good. You see, he believed preachers weren't servants. He believed, he believed preachers were servants and not celebrities. He never forgot his roots. And he was a servant, a humble servant of an illustrious master. And he loved this wee country, you know. He was burdened for it, really burdened for it. Remember, Ulster still needs Jesus. Listen, Ulster still needs Jesus. Yet, he was a true Ulster man. Yet both communities, Protestant, Catholics, came in, got saved, and set under his ministry. See, when God made the bishop, he broke the mold. He was a one-off. I remember... And Bayless Connolly's church in America, one of the pastors came to me after a few days and he says, see the bishop? He's like somebody who stepped out of the Old Testament. <laughs> and I had to agree with him. When the bishop became unwell, had to go into hospital several weeks ago. 
as he lay there week after week. And you know, that was his worst nightmare. He always dreaded that. He, hate, he hated people attending him. You know what they do in the hospital when you're in? They attend you. And I was up and I said to him, Servant, you've always said, I'd rather be in God's house than in the best bed in the royal. Well, you're in the best bed in the royal now. <laughs> and he just, he just looked up and shook his head, so he did. Someone said to me, it's sad, Michael, that pastor being in hospital, he always wanted to die with his boots on. Well, let me tell you something. I've seen the pastor for those seven weeks he was in, and I've seen pastor after pastor coming in to visit him. And I've seen him being encouraged, inspired, and then strengthen. And he would say to them, go on, press on with God, forge ahead, and use his arm, forge ahead with God. He would say, keep preaching God's word, Word, build your people up, stay faithful, teach them to give, win souls, preach the gospel. I want to assure you today, everybody, Bishop died with his boots on, right to the end. The last time I saw him was last Friday, and my last words to him were, Bishop, I'll see you in the morning. I'll see you in the morning, do you hear me? And I wasn't talking about Saturday morning. I was thinking about God's resurrection morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share and the chosen ones shall gather over on that over shore when the road is called up beyond the but there. I was thinking of that morning. And sir and lady, he would want me to say to you today, I think, will you be there? Will you be there? Will you be there at the resurrection of the just? He would say to me, tell him, are they saved? Ask him, are they saved? Are you saved? Are you soundly saved? And he would say, you Christians, you're away from God. You're up and down. You're in and out. You're off and on. Get on with God. Get back your first love and start to serve him. He's worth it. I close this tribute with a mention of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was known as the Prince of Preachers of London in the 1800s. The bishop from my youth cut his eye teeth, the spiritual eye teeth on him. In fact, this church is named in memory of him, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Spurgeon died in 1892 at the age of 58 after a long illness. His funeral service took place in Northwood Cemetery, London. A pastor, Archibald Brown, conducted the burial service and scarcely an eye was dry as he uttered his concluding sentences. Champion of God, thy battle long and nobly fought is over. The sword which cleaved to thy hand has dropped at last. A palm branch takes its place. No longer does the helmet press thy brow, oft weary with surging thoughts of battle. A victor's wreath from the great commander's hand has already proved your full reward. Death is gain. Paul said that. Death is gain. Fitting words for one who served his Lord and his generation. Fitting words for Charles Haddon Spurgeon of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, London. But it's also fitting words for Pastor James McConnell, Whitewell Metropolitan Tabernacle, Belfast, who served his generation. And by the way, Linda, that clock was two minutes fast. Weeping, and we're weeping. Weeping doesn't cover it. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and I'm looking forward to that morning. May God bless this little tribute. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Truly lovely wonderful tribute. We could say so, so much more. There's a chorus we're going to sing, and I think it's so apt to sing it. I can see the bishop on this platform, the length and breadth of it. In moments like these, I sing out. Let's stand to rest you for a minute or two from the heat. Let's sing this, and then afterwards, I'm going to call upon Pastor Jeff Wright. Let's give it gusto. Let's sing it the way the bishop sang it. In moments like these, every brother and every sister in this house, in moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to you, Lord. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. 
name you may be seated I'm going to call upon pastor jeff wright from the green pastures church a friend of pastor mcconnell good morning everybody uh, my name is pastor jeff wright and it's such a privilege and an honor uh, with my wife Lorraine to be with you here today to be home with you here and remember the giant of our time, Pastor James McConnell. I have, like Michael this morning, struggled for this moment to be very difficult. How can you capture the impact of a chosen, prepared vessel of God and yet do him justice in just a few minutes, such as the marvel that was possible. I say marvel because Jesus said that they marveled at their unbelief, but I think the Lord said that he marveled at pastor's belief. I could talk to you about the love of, of his love for Jesus that gave him such a passion for souls. It was the least of these varieties the inmate, the sick, the poor, the ordinary, the alcoholics, and the like, all kinds of people, not just your kind, but all kinds. But you would already know how knowing him changed all our lives, changed all our families. I could talk about the baptism of the holy fire in his life, that wonderful, mesmerizing fire of God in him that made us want to get close to him. And that fire was so infectious, and that fire made thousands and thousands want to know Jesus the way he knew Jesus. But you know that if you know him. You know that if you know him. Too often it is when we come near to the end of our life, when we finally understand that it is the memories and the moments we spent with those that loved us, that really defined us and shaped us. My encounter with Pastor McConnell was almost 20 years ago. I was just three. No, it's okay. It's okay. 
It was just a moment. But like you, it changed the direction of my life, my family, and eternity. I have been to Whitewell for, I had been to Whitewell for just a few weeks. I was wrestling with the call of God on my life to go to the ministry, but as an only son of a family business, it was complicated. It it didn't make sense. I I was nearly 40 and I, I, I wasn't a great student and I couldn't really talk that terrible well and, and I had no Bible school and, and, and that night there were 3,000 people uh, packed into this house and that night 23 people uh, gave their life to Jesus and responded to the gospel and I had never in 38 years of church experienced anything like this before the presence of God, the choir, the, the preach, the, the power of the preach. Even the people felt like my kind. And even when it was all over, I just sat there. I was stuck to my seat and I watched as the pastor came down from the platform and, and he walked right up to my seat, which is where that wee woman sitting right there. And, and he walked right up to me, and to my shock, he stopped at me. 3,000 people, he stopped to me, and he actually spoke to me, and he, and he said something to me. He said, son, you need to come see me. Talk to Linda. She will arrange a time. Well, I didn't say anything. To be honest, I couldn't say anything. Uh, I couldn't speak because I was so scared of him. (laughs) And I was so shocked that he would speak to me. I guess he was so tuned in, so tuned in to people's pain and their turmoil. Can I hear an amen? Through the Holy Spirit, that gift that was in him. Well, I didn't even know who Linda was. But I found out later that she ran the church. And everybody said, Amen. And here's what I want to say. He called me son. And I know, and you know, that I'm not a son. But he made us feel like we were sons. He made us feel like we were. The Apostle Paul said there are 10,000 instructors, but not many fathers in the gospel. I am blessed to have an extraordinary dad. But that night God introduced me to my need of a spiritual father in the gospel. I had met many pastors who instructed me but none that wanted to invest in me. You see, a spiritual father is somebody who makes deposits in your life. He leaves memories. He makes memories and moments that impact your walk and your talk, and they form you, and they shape you, and they will position you for the purpose of God in your life if you will submit to their authority. And and it wasn't hard. It's not hard. I believe Jesus put it this way. If you love me, you will obey my commands. See, it's a love thing. It's a love thing that makes it easy to obey and honor the spiritual father of the house. And even the stranger that I was back then, pastor took me in. Like, I was a stranger. I, they, Michael calls me a blue one. I was a blue one, but he took me in. He, he didn't even really know who I was. And he gave me the great privilege of going round with all the pastors to visit the sick and the weary. And, and they taught me how to pray for people. They taught me how to, 
how to minister to people. I had never seen anything like this before, and I, and I had the privilege of getting to know the bishop as we journeyed together to Dublin to plant the Dublin church, and he had, he had such a laugh. He, he was mischievous, is all I can say. He was, he was just mischievous. And, and, he, and as Michael said, he just loved fish supper. Not the picture of holiness in a dress that I remembered in my time in religious circles. He was holy, but it was because of what was in him that made that difference. He became my Bible college, my theologian, my professor, my go-to find out understanding and truth in the scriptures. And over the years, I got to get close to the man. The man, the man that had the fire of God in him. And that is such a privilege. He taught me how to fall in love with Jesus. And, and I discovered that if he had a thousand hearts to give, Lord, that he would give them all. When it came to my time to plant Green Pastors Church, I took what he invested in me and I just deposited it in them. And they became his kind. They became his kind of people too, and they loved him. They loved him. They loved him when he came to preach because of the Christ in him. And so, to be honest, Green Pastors Church is just another branch of Pastor McConnell's great ministry. And I want to say to Mrs. McConnell, to Linda, to Julie, I never really knew you, Julie, but, and the rest of the family, we owe you a great debt of gratitude today because you had to share your daddy with the likes of us and only you know the sacrifice that that was but today we thank you and we honour you and we pray that the Lord will richly bless and keep you and make it up to you and uh, as only our Heavenly Father can do. But know this, this land will miss him. The nation will miss him. We will miss him. I will miss him. To whom do I go to now? Our giant in the faith, the servant, the bishop, Pastor McConnell, has gone home to be with the Lord. And we love him. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. It's tough, isn't it? This is difficult. Thank you, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Michael, for those tributes. Now I'm going to ask Norman, representing the family, to come and bring a family tribute. Come on, Norman. It was the bishop that said the best wine is always kept to the last. Just a wee verse from the Psalms. As for me, I shall be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. The next face that the bishop is going to see is the face of his Savior. And what a day that's going to be. I am emotional, but I can imagine a voice saying, Get on with it, son. Dry your eyes. 
It's my absolute honor and privilege to be standing here today giving this tribute on behalf of our family. Pastor McConnell was the founder and the father of this great house, but to us, his family, he was Jim to Margaret, he was dad to Linda and Julie, and to Brian, Nathan, and me, he was dad also. He was granda to Rebecca, and to Charlie, he was ganda, Jim, without the R. And from time to time, we all knew him affectionately at home as Big Jim. This past year, pastor's health hasn't been good with various ailments, all coming together at once and resulting in him being admitted to the Royal Victoria Hospital on the 31st of May. Little did we know that he would remain there for seven weeks and finally pass away whilst in hospital care. And this brings me to say this, on behalf of our family, I want to pay a huge tribute and offer our sincere and heartfelt thanks to the consultants, the doctors, the nurses, the palliative care team, and the ancillary staff of Ward 6C of the Royal Victoria Hospital for the care, the love, and the devotion you heaped upon him while he was there. You went above and beyond on many occasions to treat him and to look after him. And we as a family just think that you are amazing. So thank you. Our immediate family is not large by any stretch of the imagination. There are only nine of us, including the First Lady of Whitewell, pastor's lovely, amazing wife, Margaret. Together over these past days, we have mourned the loss of Pastor James with many, many tears and raw, broken hearts. My tribute this morning is not so much about the work here at Whitewell and its illustrious and wonderful history. This has been catalogued multiple times over the years in books, magazines, television interviews, radio programs, and dare I say it, even in courtrooms. My tribute is about a humble family of four, Pastor, Margaret, Linda, and Julie, and a vision birthed by the Holy Spirit to pioneer and raise up a mighty work for the kingdom of God here in the Whitewell area. My tribute is about the love for people and their souls, the graft that was put in to build something from virtually nothing, the dedication to look after the small band of people that came together in a cold orange hall that first Sunday in 1957, and through God, mold them into a mighty church. And my tribute is about the tears and sacrifice of family life and precious, never-to-be-regained family time in order to be there for the church and the people of God. Those early years from 1957 were years of struggle and hardship. Anyone looking on and seeing, as pastor would say, this motley bunch of people would say they were more to be pitied than laughed at. Trying to build a work and raise a family on such a meager income was well nigh impossible, but there was a passion and a burning desire in the young Jim McConnell's heart that could not and would not be extinguished. Pastor walked miles visiting this congregation, both at home and when they were in hospital. Walking was his only option. He had, as there was no money for a car or even enough for the bus fare. That would come 13 years later, and so would their first holiday. Margaret recalls many times cutting up cardboard to make insoles for his shoes to keep his feet dry because his shoes were letting in. They definitely weren't like the children of Israel's, which lasted for 40 years. Linda remembers one time being really ill, uh, uh, and Margaret and Pastor, Linda remembers um, being very ill, and Margaret and Pastor didn't have enough money even for the prescription. And Pastor lifted Linda in his arms and prayed for healing. And the Lord graciously answered prayer on and on, instances of his servant's obedience to his call, even 
in the midst of hardship. Pastor McConnell didn't have a manual or a step-by-step -step guide telling him how to build a work for God. The only thing he knew was to work and to work and then to work some more. As you can imagine, it wasn't easy for Margaret in those days, raising two girls and trying to make ends meet when she had very little to start with. While she was at home, pastor was out at meetings or visiting the sick and needy of the congregation, but she was behind him 100% because she knew that he was fulfilling God's call on both of their lives to build this work for God's glory. As many of you know, Pastor McConnell was not blessed with any DIY skills, thankfully. He could turn the simplest task into an absolute demolition job. <laughs> Margaret took on most of those jobs, from wiring plugs to wallpapering and painting. We had a saying about Big Jim. In the pulpit, he was a master, but in everything else, he was a disaster. <laughs> this was our bishop, and we loved him. But thankfully, in the fullness of time, God sent Brian, and Brian became the family fixer. If it breaks down, you call Brian, and he sorts it out. The girls, Linda and Julie, knew from an early age that their daddy wasn't the kind of man who would attend the school Christmas play or parent-teacher meetings or school sports days. In those early days, Whitewell had prayer meetings every night of the week, and this lasted for two years. That's where their dad was. And the girls accepted that and got on with it and never complained. As Whitewell grew, things became easier for the pastor and for the family. He had a livable wage coming in. The Whitewellers loved the family, and their loyalty and support was amazing. Pastor zeal and dedication never waned. Instead, it increased. And three building programs later, here we are, sitting in this magnificent building, reaching people around the world, feeding, educating, and medicating people in Ethiopia and Kenya. It is incredible that from some, such humble beginnings, God would honor a man's obedience and his faithfulness to his calling and enable him to achieve these wonderful things in his name and for his kingdom. Invitations come in to preach around the world, and we, Margaret, got the opportunity to go with him at last on some of those trips, especially to the United States, where they met wonderful friends in John and his late wife, Dale Eslenbaum, who have been such a blessing to them. Pastor at heart and at home was a man of very simple tastes. Some people think he was a complicated individual, but he really wasn't, although granted he had his moments. Take, for example, his choice of movies. He loved the old black and white westerns. And every time you went into the house, you felt you had to duck as all you could hear was a gunfight taking place somewhere in the Wild West, or some poor cowboy flying out through the window of a saloon. Another love the pastor had was food, but not fancy fare. Give him a feast supper, as Pastor Michael and Jeff said, from Eddie Spence's in East Belfast, or a good Chinese, or a hamburger, but it had to have a Coke. And he was a happy man. He loved getting all the family together um, for a feed and a laugh, whether it was in the house or in the restaurant. He enjoyed watching football match. Always loved it when Linfield won. Although today's game was wick compared to 60 years ago, which he called the golden days. He talked with Nathan for hours about football. Even in the hospital, even near the end, he was talking about football. And footballers that we had never heard of called Herbie Haggerty and Wilbur Cush and all the greats of yesteryears. One of the things a bishop was probably best known for was his love of cats. When I joined the McConnell household 42 years ago, I quickly learned that if I didn't like cats, which I really didn't, my relationship with the family would be shorter than Henry VIII's marriages. <laughs> the man drew every stray in North Belfast to his door. It seemed that word went out in the cat world that there was grub at Eight Serpentine Road. He had more cats at the back door than the RSPCA. Julie had her own cat called Darkie, and Pastor loved him. Margaret tells the story of how Pastor would come home and shout, Where are you, we love? 
and Margaret would turn around to say, I'm here, Jim, only to realize he was talking to the cat. <laughs> we may not be a big family, but we are close. Linda and I had Rebecca. Julie married Brian. They and Rebecca married Nathan, and they had wee Charlie James, and Granda Jim just loved him to bits. He would always say, he's a great Bobby. And over the last seven and a half weeks, Every time our phone rang in the house, Charlie would say, that's Ganda Jim's doctor. He's going to miss his great granda. So are we. Pastor James to us as a family is going to be irreplaceable. He had so many lovely attributes. He could seem hard and scary to some people, but underneath that exterior was a really gentle and caring man. And if you forgive the analogy, he was a pussycat. He could be quick to rebuke, but he was even quicker to forgive and to forget. He became my dad when my own dad died. And I know that Brian and Nathan feel the same way as they have both lost their dads as well. We're going to miss him so much. Rebecca is Pastor McConnell's only grandchild and he was so proud of her. He was proud of her in her career. He loved her worshiper's heart, always encouraging her to excel and asking her, when are you singing next love? Then his two girls, Linda and Julie, they adored their dad and he adored them. Linda was her dad's personal assistant for 40 years. Dear lover, she was his right hand, looking after all his appointments, and she was and still is the church administrator and everything else you could think of. He once described Linda as the best man that I have. And Julie, or as dad used to call her, Jukes, Julie Jukes, that was her nickname affectionately. She wasn't so fond of church in the early years. And when dad would get up to preach, she would start misbehaving on purpose. And she would say to Margaret, take me out and beat me just to get out of the sanctuary. <laughs> Julie is the hairdresser of the family, as you can see by my lovely looks this morning. And she always had mom and dad looking their best, whatever the occasion. And during these past difficult days of illness, she and Linda have constantly been with their dad at home and in hospital, making sure he had everything he needed. Later life has enabled the girls to have a lovely special bond with their dad. After sharing them over their lifetime with thousands of people who at times took priority over family life, these last weeks while Pastor was in hospital, their love and their care for him was beautiful to watch as they stayed at his bedside 24-7 the, until the Lord took dad home on Saturday morning. And finally, there is Margaret. The lady has stood with him by his side every mile of this sometimes hard but wonderful journey. You allowed him to go and build this magnificent house for the glory of God. You were selfless and faithful, never complained and always in your place and all, almost always in the background, but you were always there. Last week in hospital, Margaret was able to go up and see Pastor, and they had a precious time together. This will be so precious for Margaret to remember in the days ahead. And after Margaret had left, Pastor was reminiscing about his mom and his dad and his sister, Lila, and he said to the girls, you know, your mom was the perfect wife. He said, she never held me back. She had never complained. Even when I wasn't able to take her anywhere or give her very much or give her the things she deserved, he said, she's still lovely, and she's still lovely today. As I finish this tribute to this remarkable man, let me just share something with you that Pastor said to me one afternoon last week. His voice was very, very weak, as the pastors will agree when they went to see him. He leaned over, and Linda had gone to get tea, and he said, Norman, the anointing brings with it a heavy burden, and it never leaves you. That burden was the burden for the work. He never lost that burden right up until the end. At 10 past 8 on Saturday morning, he loved this house, but more than that, he loved the people of this house. And that love drove him on for over 60 years as he served here. I'll not finish by saying, thank you, Pastor. I'll just say, thank you, Dad. 
we are going to miss you so very, very much, but we are going to see you again on that great day when the King comes back again to establish His kingdom, and you will be right there with Him. And as He used to say many, many times on a Sunday morning as He stood here around the table, He used to say, till the day, and that's the day we're looking forward to. Now, we didn't have a special singer today, but we do have someone very special, and I'm going to let him have the last word. So, will you just relax and just enjoy the wonderful singing of Pastor McConnell? The sands have been washed in the footprints of the stranger on Galilee's shores, and the voice that subdued the rough billows will be heard in Judea no more. But the path of that lone Galilean with joy I will follow today. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. And the toils will seem nothing, brother and sister. Sermon. when you get to the end of the way. Please, there's another verse. Do you know it? Oh, no, please. He loves me too much <laughs> to forsake me. And he loves to me, me too much to, to forsake me or to give me one trial too much. All his people have been dearly me. purchased and Satan can never get such. I know in his word he has promised that my strength it should be as my day. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. And the toils of the road will seem nothing when I get to the end of the way. Oh, it's so difficult to sing that without breaking into tears. Yes. But we'll feel the presence of the Galilean here today. He's lovely. He's wonderful. No wonder he's called the altogether lovely one. Thank you to Pastor Michael, Pastor Jeff, thank you Norman for those beautiful, beautiful tributes. I'm sure you would agree with me. You just say amen to that. Just summing up this dear man, this servant of God that we have come to know and to love and to cherish. I want to read to you a verse and part of a verse. It's taken from Psalm 31. And it says this, Psalm 31 and verse 14, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. My times are in your hand. 
so says David the king of Israel. Whether it was the time of looking after the family sheep on Bethlehem's hills, or the killing of the Philistine Goliath in the valley of Elah, whether it was the years of hiding from the treacherous Saul who sought his life, the time of his coronation, the time of conquest, the times of power, even the times of family tragedy. Yes, from the time of his birth to the time of his death at the age of 70, David knew that each of his times were in God's hands. And ladies and gentlemen, today what is said of David is also true of every one of us here this morning. Our times are in his hand. Our lives are full of times, whether those times be good or bad, whether those times be high or low, whether those times be colorful or dark, whether those times be eventful times or even significant times, they are times. Times of God's ordaining and times of God's decreeing. Times. Times chiseled out and fashioned by the invisible hand of God's sovereignty and God's glorious providence. Times. Times woven together to form the tapestry of life. And so in our text today, David rejoices, my times are in your hand. And what times David's son Solomon speaks of in the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up or a time to reap, a time to build, a time to laugh, a time to love, a time to speak, and a time of peace. Ladies and gentlemen today, the times of James McConnell are also in the Almighty's hand. A time to be born. The second child born to Edward and Jean McConnell on the 15th of May, 1937. A conception. A conception of a fetus in the womb with a destiny in it that was realized. Oh, so many don't get to be realized today because of the genocide of abortion. But in that life, in that embryo, in that fetus, there was a destiny, a destiny that was realized, and that time was in God's hand. A time to kill? Oh, that was the war years and the blitz of the German Nazis and the Luftwaffe on the city of Belfast when he was but a boy. Even then, that time was in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, a time to weep and a time to loose, says Solomon. That was when first his mother Jean and then his father Edward died, leaving him an orphan. But even those orphan deaths, those times, were also in God's hands. The time of his conversion, the time of his conversion to Christ as a boy, knelt at a wooden bench with his Sunday school teacher in the old iron hall. Oh, that time, that time when he found the Savior and the Savior found him. And having been introduced to that Savior, James McConnell would spend the rest of his life 
introducing thousands upon thousands to that very Savior. Oh, that time in the iron hall, the little boy in short pants, that time was in God's magnificent hand. Ladies and gentlemen, what a time. Then a time to speak says Solomon. Oh, he preached his first sermon at 14, based on Psalm 22. And then at the Easter Convention in April 1955, he was ordained to the ministry. That time when hands were laid on him, that time was also in God's hand. And then off speaking, and then off preaching, in England. But on the 23rd of February, 1957, there was another time of God's ordaining. It was time to plant. Solomon says there's a time to plant. And that that date in February of 57, it was a time to plant. It was time to plant a church on the White Well Road in an old orange hall with 10 people to help. A seed was planted. A seed was planted that would grow into a great ministry known around the world. Oh, what a time that Sunday morning as the young preacher stood. He knew. He was conscious. He was aware. This time is also in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, a time that evidently was in God's hand. A time to love. A time to love in April 1959 when he married Margaret Foster, the woman, the gracious woman, the beautiful woman that God put at his side for that destiny to be realized. Then, the times of sowing the times of hardship, the times of difficulty, the times of witnessing, the times of weeping, the times of being faithful in the days of small things. But he believed and he knew and he was certain that even those hard times, those times were also in God's hand, molding him, fashioning him, preparing him for what? for the times of reaping. Those times were also in God's hand. The times of nothing were in God's hand, but so was the times of reaping. Souls and souls and souls and souls. He didn't reap vegetables. He reaped precious souls all around the world. The time the time he introduced me to Jesus Christ. The time he introduced you to Jesus Christ. The time he preached that glorious gospel of our blessed God. That time was also in his hand. Our time started to interlock and time started to come together. Ladies and gentlemen, the times he led us to the Savior, church planting, branches going over the walls, inspiring a new generation of preachers. Those times, James McConnell could say, my times, those times are in your hand. Ladies and gentlemen, truly, there was a man sent from God whose name was James. And his times to God's glory was in his hands. This past number of weeks has been so difficult, heartbreaking, heartrending. Don't know where to put ourselves. Oh, he held me as a baby. 56 years ago in his hands and dedicated me to the Lord in the plush, plush surroundings of an orange hall one Sunday morning. 
He was 29 years of age, and I was a matter of weeks. He has been part of my life, all my life. I was with him in the Orange Hall days, and Linda and I were joking the other day about the Orange Hall and running up the stairs and looking out the wee cuppy hole, and I'm shouting at us and telling us off. I was with him in the Orange Hall days. We were with him at the church at the bottom of the Whitewell Road, the church with the spire. That's where he introduced me to Jesus Christ. That's where him and Tommy Kearns baptize me in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's where I was called to the ministry as a boy of 15 through a prophetic utterance that he gave. And I thank God this morning all those times with him were in his, in his hands. We've all been pulling the files of memory this week, and we've all been remembering and pulling the files of memory and this memory. Do you remember that? And do you remember this? And people have remembered the days at Windsor Park. People have remembered the days of the King's Hall. Remember the days in leisure centers and auditoriums and preaching the gospel. The McNeil Hall down there in Lorne, planting churches in Scotland and in Wales and in England and down south and overseas. You all have your own memory today. You remember him as the preacher, as the evangelist, as the teacher. And those memories are dear and precious and, oh, truly so important. I was speaking with my mom yesterday, and she says, David, what memory have you got of him at the minute? I says, Mom, not the memory that other people have. They have the memory of the preacher. I says, I remember the day as a boy of 14, he came into our house in Glengormley, and he told me that moments earlier, the IRA had assassinated my father, and he wept on my shoulder, and I wept on his shoulder. You see, I read some time ago this little phrase, and I believe there's lots of truth in it. People aren't really friends until, first of all, they have cried together. And he cried with me, and I cried with him. And you know, there's a powerful lesson there. He loved the crowds, preaching to the crowds, but he was so wise to understand and to know that the crowd is made up of the individuals. And the individual was as important to him as the crowd. And here this up-and-coming great preacher, he comes into my room and he cries with me. That's my particular memory. There's memories we all share. You can't share that one with me. That's my memory. He was so precious, so dear, so important, truly. There was a man sent from God whose name was James. Even the time of illness was in God's hands, yes. Even to the nurses, he was praying with the nurses. One little Catholic nurse says, he gave me a blessing. What she meant was he prayed for me and my family. Ladies and gentlemen, even his time of illness was in God's hand. And yes, his time to die on Saturday the 17th of July in 2021, not a day early and not a day late from the time that Jehovah had ordained. The 17th day of the seventh month. The book of Genesis, in chapter 8 and verse 4, reads, Then the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. The world had died and been buried in a watery grave, but the ark came to rest on the seventeenth day of the seventh month on the mountains of Ararat, and the world enjoyed a resurrection. 
James McConnell on the 17th day of the seventh month of July entered his rest, and he too will enjoy resurrection. His times are in his hand. So is that it? Not at all. This is not the end. This is only the end of the beginning. The best for James McConnell is yet to be. God has still more times in his hand pertaining to Pastor McConnell, a time of resurrection. He's, it's not God's will for his redeemed to exist eternally in disembodied spirits and souls and states. No, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, no, not at all. There will be a time of bodily resurrection. That time is in God's hand. When will that time be? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. That time is in God's hand. Raised as Paul says to the Corinthians, raised incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, and then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? A time yet to be, and that time is in his hand. You take a grain of wheat, but you have to bury it in the earth, and you have to cover it over, and you have to leave it. But there comes a time when it breaks through, and there's a harvest. Family, in the next hour, you will plant a seed in the ground. Even that moment, even that time is in God's hand. But there will be, there will be a time at the return of Christ when what was buried will live again at the time of resurrection, hallelujah, and the time of the reunion of the elect. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. It'll finish then. No. There will be a time of reward. Not of death, but according to Jesus in the parable of the talents, when the Lord of those servants returns, he will say, James, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I can see his big beaming face, Linda. As he goes up to the Savior, he has loved and proclaimed. And has smiled as the king says, James, well done. That time is also in God's hand. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11, and I'm almost done. It says, and he will make everything beautiful in his time. And that is still to be. Bishop, all your times those already realized and those still future, they are all in his hands as you have been in his hands. Glory, glory, glory to God.
that James McConnell was afforded another 30 seconds of life. If by some means he was allowed to sit up in his casket and could say one more sentence, I believe I know what he would say. He would sit up and he would have a good look around first and he would point his finger and say this to one and all. You make sure you meet me in heaven. That's what he would say. And so today, if you don't know the great Savior of Jesus Christ, or today you have found yourself away from that great Savior, it is time for you to return. It is time for you to come. Make sure that you will meet him in the glory. This is not a defeat. This is not a defeat. We are here today to honor a champion. We are not here to glorify him. We are not here to deify him. But we are here today to thank God for the life that God gave him and the ministry that God entrusted to him. We are here today to rejoice. We are here to say, thank you, Lord. We are here to say there is victory. I am going to ask you to stand. Would you stand? We are not going to have a one-minute silence. I'm going to ask you for one minute. Will you clap and give God thanks for the ministry and the man that he gave to Jim McCann? be seated. Before we have our closing hymn, I, I need to give you a few short announcements, and I ask you, please, would you listen carefully, and please be compliant with the instructions that we're going to give for the time when we leave this building, it is important that we leave it safely and carefully. After the benediction has been pronounced, we would ask you to remain standing as the coffin and the pastors and the family exit. We would ask you not to move, to move away from your seat, but to remain. What will happen in the foyer, you will be able to watch on the two screens. We will be taking the pastor's coffin to the hearse, and once the coffin has been placed in the hearse and the family have left with the hearse, then, ladies and gentlemen, our stewards will direct you to leave. Please do not leave until you're asked to do so. And when you leave the building, it is important that you keep your mask on and as much as is possible, remain two meters apart. When you get outside, please keep your mask on. 
And can I ask you to move away from the exit so that a bottleneck doesn't, isn't created? And please maintain that social distancing uh, outside. The grave is strictly private. It is the family only. That is their time. Please do not be following the hearse or the family. We want the family to have that time for themselves. Please, we ask you to listen to those announcements and follow them. And thank you on behalf of Pastor McConnell. Thank you on behalf of his family for being able to be here today and to share in this service of thanksgiving. Pastor Irwin is going to come now and lead us in our closing hymn. And then we will have our closing prayer and benediction. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor David. Could we all stand? Could we sing this lovely hymn, Majestic Sweetness Sits Enthroned? This is one of the bishop's favorites. And again, let's sing this. Let's raise the roof. This great hymn of victory. Every brother and every sister in the house then. <clears throat> Everyone then as we worship. Majestic.
Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Oscar Gable. Let us pray. Eternal Father, in the glorious name of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we bow our heads and heart in your presence. We thank you, gracious Lord, for the gift of life that you've given to each one of us. We thank you that our times are in your hand. There's no better place, no safer place for those times to be. We thank you for the life that you gave to James McConnell. We thank you for every remembrance of him. We thank you, gracious Lord. He has finished his course. He has fought the fight. He has kept the faith. Henceforth, there is led up for him a crown of righteousness which the Lord shall give unto him. And not to him only, but unto all those who love his appearing. Lord, thank you for this time. Speak to some heart. Draw some wanderer back to yourself. At this time, remind us of our own mortality and of our own time when we will stand in the courtroom of God. We worship you and praise you, Lord. We bring to you this precious family. This day, may they know the comfort and the peace and the strength of the Almighty as they spend those few moments alone at the graveside. Stand with them, we pray. And today and in the days and weeks to come, Lord, I pray you will bring to their remembrance memories they've even forgotten till now. And may those memories put smiles on their faces, and encourage them. Thank you for each one here today. Separate us now, Lord, with your blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain and abide upon us until Jesus comes again. Amen. Would you please remain standing? Pastors, would you join us? There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits over the way To prepare us a dwelling place there We will sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed And our spirits will sorrow no more Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will For the glorious gifts of His love And the blessings that hallow our days In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet
in the sweet. 